Hello, my name is James Payne, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the MIT Sloan School of Management in the System Dynamics Group. And today I'm here to present some of my work in progress research, specifically talking about how we can apply a modified PID controller design, which I call an endogenized PID controller design, um, to specific economic situations um, here, uh, speculative bubble formation. So when I say speculative bubbles, one of the first things that many people think of is, of course, the tulip mania, um, uh, the massive uh, increased price of uh, tulips. Um, but then, of course, there's been some more recent examples. We can uh, talk about um, thoroughbred horse prices uh, in the 1980s specifically. And slightly more recently, there's been investigation um, uh, into uh, sort of the emergence of bubbles in, in commodities. Um, then, of course, many folks over the last uh, really decade have talked about uh, multiple waves of speculative bubble formations in cryptocurrency markets and, and even uh, European footballer salaries uh, choosing here to show uh, the 2014 uh, championship team. Um, so uh, I'll say one thing about the tulip mania, which is one of the ones that um, uh, many folks kind of think of when they think of sort of classical speculative bubbles. There's been also a lot of uh, richer research recently talking about how that might not have necessarily been a true bubble, uh, but that's neither here nor there for the sake of this talk. Uh, what it really boils down to is this idea that speculative bubbles are not necessarily limited to one specific location or industry, uh, but can occur in, in sort of really any market that features some concept of floating prices. So when we talk about speculative bubbles, um, my own research primarily is less on a sort of price formation and more on um, inventory control systems. Uh, so Speculative bubbles and inventory control systems, how are those related? Well, over here, this is from a, a piece of work called Testing for Speculative Bubbles. You kind of sort of see the, the classical disconnect between the underlying signal and, and, the, and the, uh, the price that's being realized in the market. This is from uh, uh, another piece um, of work that kind of uses the same terminology of speculative bubble formation, but in much more of a, of a sort of supply chain context. Uh, in this case, talking about um, these ideas of, of forming expectations of the future in order to set an inventory control system. Now, even then these patterns of behavior, you can see them even in sort of just sort of classical process dynamics and control literature. Uh, this idea in this case, this is a response of different uh, values of first specific control parameter within a, a PID controller design. So really uh, my argument here is that speculation can be framed as a dynamic control problem. It's one in which uh, a group of people are forming some sort of expectation of the future and are then balancing that against a current um, risk management, uh, sort of a sort of a future reward versus a current risk, uh, which is exactly what you do uh, when you set up a sort of a classical control problem um, in sort of a, an inventory control setting or even in a control setting. So when I say control setting, we have to come back to our old friend, the PID controller. Uh, for I think most of this audience, this will be review. Um, but when I say PID controller, what do I mean? I'm specifically referring to this idea um, that you take some sort of input signal uh, and you, or sorry, you take some sort of sort of state of your world and you compare it to a set point, some sort of goal, and you use the difference between those two to construct an input signal that's used to update um, your process to hopefully close the gap between um, sort of the state of the world uh, as you see it versus the state of the world as you would like for it to be. So we can then go ahead and, and take this sort of classic block diagram uh, version of PID controller, which you can see right there has, has at least some degree of feedback, translated into a compartmental model. Um, now, one thing that's interesting here is that uh, real systems, the, the input is not necessarily exogenous. At minimum, we should go ahead and probably incorporate some idea of anchoring and adjustment. Um, this is used repeatedly within um, sort of supply chain uh, you can talk about um, sort of the origins of oscillations within supply chain, classic bullwhip, uh, behavioral papers um, from you know, uh, uh, Corson and, and, and Sturman, um, and even more recent behavioral economics work, uh, the work by, by Rabin and, and of course, uh, Tversky and Kahneman. Um, and this is directly relevant to speculative bubble formation, uh, because in that sense, for any amount of time, when any one of these bubbles sort of exists um, for, for any sort of appreciable amount of time, the current state of the system, the speculation in of itself, uh, influences the expectation uh, of the individuals who are acting in that, in that system. So what this allows me to do is then construct what I call an endogenized PID controller, one in which your output signal directly affects your set point. Um, as you can see kind of right here with some degree of information smoothing, which is somewhat context specific. 
for a practical example for the second half of this talk, I'm going to take this uh, sort of methodological framework and apply it to one of the real world examples we talked about earlier, which is specifically this idea of the thoroughbred horse market. Now, there's a lot of information on the screen, but what it really boils down to is that over the years of 1965 to about 1990, there was this surge in the value of or the sale value of thoroughbred horses. Uh, but the actual sort of underlying um, expected return in terms of sort of pot um, price for, for winning a race uh, was relatively flat. It did increase slightly, but not in a way that would support um, sort of this gigantic surge and then correction in prices. Uh, so in terms of sort of what kind of sort of happened structurally, this idea that speculative purchasing based on expected prices drove up the, the prices today. Um, the eventual concern about over speculation and sort of this idea that that you are engaging in a risky activity and that the value of the good, in this case, a horse, is becoming decoupled from its uh, sort of true underlying value, um, sort of the price of the good. Uh, and then what I think is interesting, though, is if you look at that at previous price and even the ones with, the, if you look at the graphs of the, of the tulip prices and everything else like that, often these speculative bubbles do not necessarily collapse back down to where they originally were. Uh, they often end at some other value. So it's possible that this process embeds some additional value, that the underlying value of the good, in this case horses, is materially changed by the speculation in and of itself. So now taking this structure we had before, let's go ahead and operationalize it for this specific example. So this is the same, functionally the same framework, now just sort of rewritten in a way that fits with this example of thoroughbred horse pricing. Uh, and now let's go ahead and try to um, uh, match it to the historic data. So with these values, you end up getting um, a sort of simulated value that uh, has a good fit to um, the historic prices. Uh, and it's driven by the single sort of underlying surge in expected prices, this, this perceived value um, um, surge. So what's interesting about this fit is you notice a couple of different things. One, there's asymmetric expectations for pricing. So this idea that uh, how do you respond to falling prices versus how do you respond to rising prices? Um, you have a, a different sensitivity to those values. Um, you uh, have almost no immediate risk sensitivity. You rather um, are mostly dealing with this idea for projection of prices. So it's you underplaying sort of the buildup of immediate um, difference between the underlying value and the and the uh, perceived value in the market. Uh, what's interesting, and this just came out of the calibration activity, is in this case the the projection time, the the the, the forward projection period, ended up being approximately the average maturation time of the good itself, which makes sense. It's this idea that you kick off a unit of production, um, you know, in this case, uh, starting uh, to breed a new thoroughbred horse, and so you are pricing based upon what you expect you're going to get out of that horse uh, at some point uh, in the future when it's actually saleable. Something to note is many different exogenous pulses can trigger this particular um, um, speculation. Uh, most of the other parameters remain uh, directionally similar. Uh, in this case, uh, sort of uh, artificially limited to this one year pulse. Uh, so this then structure allows us to then uh, even do some policy records. Now, one thing that's interesting is, is I think the central problem here is not necessarily that the underlying value changed, and I'll talk about this later on. I, th I think this is actually an interesting um, observation that the speculation kind of embeds in this additional value, in this case in the horses, of them as an investment um, investment object, more so than just uh, an origin or a source of a, of a purse. Uh, and instead, what I think the real problem here is this moment right here, this moment where you have this overshoot and, and correction. Uh, that is really the inefficiency in the system. That's really the point in which, uh, in my mind, a, a policy would allow us to smoothly transition from a lower to an upper uh, point within the space. So we can kind of investigate that with a bit of sensitivity analysis, analysis, uh, sensitivity analysis, get an idea of where which prices are stabilizing, or sorry, which parameters are stabilizing versus destabilizing. A lot of this can also be derived directly from sort of control theory. If you look at sort of uh, back to that original um, um, Seaborg book about uh, process control and design, we talk about the influences of the P, the I, and the D. Uh, that comes in uh, in some of these observations as well, in addition to um, sort of observations around the, the time constants and um, sort of expectation smoothing. Um, so given the sensitivity analysis, we can now come up with a new policy recommendation and allow us to smoothly, when still uh, exposed to the same initial shock, smoothly transition from the, the lower um, underlying value to the higher underlying value without having that transient overshoot and correction in between. <clears throat> 
And specifically what comes out of this is you have longer and now symmetric times to incorporate this new information. Um, sport forward speculation is effectively eliminated, is completely eliminated. Um, and, the, and the immediate value discrepancy uh, is, is now the largest source of, of, of consideration. Um, so historic speculation is still considered, uh, but um, uh, and that is actually important because that historic speculation is what embeds this investment uh, signal into, into the object. In this case, uh, that incorporation of the, which, in, which on a PID controller would be the I portion, that's the part that incorporates this new information that this object has some sort of value connected to it as an investment um, um, right. So some final notes. Uh, this specific example here, we talk about how asymmetric responses and overweighting on the expected uh, future uh, at the uh, sort of the detriment of present risk um, uh, perception uh, exacerbates this overshoot. Um, and it's possible to embed um, the value of an asset without necessarily uh, having these bubble outcomes. Now, this, this model as a whole, this endogenized PID uh, so framework um, is sufficient to generate these observed speculative behaviors and also provide policy recommendations. It's sort of the purpose of that example to highlight that. Um, and it also, in my mind, highlights how some of the existing methodological paths in system dynamics, specifically with our roots, um, sort of applying control theory to, to larger social systems um, can be applied in, in multiple research areas. In this case, I'm taking some, some work I was doing on the supply chain side and applying it to more of a behavioral uh, uh, economics um, uh, side. Um, and also it's uh, most, in this case, a specific framework is most appropriate where speculative bubbles are being driven by expectation dynamics rather than market dynamics. An original version of this model was very, very dependent on sort of capturing the underlying uh, uh, sort of physical traits of the system, talking about gestation of horses and the actual mechanisms by which sort of uh, um, auction pricing comes together. Uh, that turned out to be completely secondary in terms of importance. Uh, for driving us back with the bubble formation versus this right here, this idea of, of sort of a mismatch between um, between counting on uh, an expectation of the future versus uh, incorporating immediate risk sensitively. So uh, thank you very much. I hope that this framework will prove useful for others. Um, and I hope that we have um, some, some rigorous conversation uh, about this going forward. Thank you.